Second uh, presentation this morning, uh, certainly a topic on our, on our mind this time of year as we look forward to planning for another cropping season, is the, is the input side. And we wanted to have a discussion on, in terms of what the outlook looks like, looks like in terms of crop inputs. To do, to do that this morning will be Dr. Bob Tregell. He's the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of AMVAC Corporation. He's enjoyed a 32-year leadership career in agribusiness, working for companies such as Herxt, Aventus, Bayer, Shearing, and FMC. He has working experience and knowledge in Europe, Asia, and the Americas at all levels of agribusiness. In addition, he has worked at the county, regional, and corporate general management level. And he's also been an adjunct professor at the Berlin School of Economics and Law for 20 years, educating MBAs as future leaders in global business and society. Bob is past Voice Chair and Treasurer of Crop Life America, past uh, Executive Board Member and Treasurer of the Agriculture Retailer Association. Currently, he's the Treasurer of the Crop Life Foundation and Board Member of the Agriculture Retailer Association. So please welcome Bob Tregell as he's going to talk about crop out inputs this morning. So again, uh, good morning. I'd like to start off by uh, just thanking those uh, folks who uh, are here in the room, but also uh, online uh, for your business. We really appreciate it. Also like to thank the United Potato Growers Association for having us present uh, this morning. So the, uh, sorry. Yeah, the topic, uh, the topic that I was asked to uh, talk about today was input and particularly uh, China ag chem uh, sourcing. Now you may also translate some of that also to the uh, fertilizer side because the Chinese are also big in raw materials. Um, so you know why, let me just put some context into China. China is also, for those of you who don't know that, many of you probably do know that, the uh, largest uh, potato growing nation in the world as far as area. Right? They still have a lot of issues in regards to uh, efficiency, but they do have large farms and the, certainly the, the, uh, the fresh market uh, is, I, say, I would say, still growing in China, um, but uh, also McDonald's is growing in China. Uh, so, so potatoes are important also to uh, China uh, domestically. Um, you know, what is my connection to China? Uh, prior to joining AMVAC, I was the uh, Asia president uh, for my previous company, and I was based out of Hong Kong, and I also had an office in, uh, in uh, Shanghai. Uh, also oversaw the business in uh, India, and in India, also the potato market is also uh, uh, growing. And then as a professor, uh, uh, 20 years ago, I started the first MBA program for the first Chinese coming out of China to, well, learn how we do business in the, uh, in the West and probably educated more than uh, 500 uh, Chinese uh, MBA uh, students. So uh, just for your information, uh, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, studying uh, and doing business uh, in China. So um, I think the topic for today is basically three, three uh, agenda points, what's the implications for the global crop protection market, uh, how is the supply chain evolving, and then what is the impact for uh, U.S. growers and the distribution channel. And it really demands you know, three things that you have to really think about. Uh, what's your strategy? Uh, do your suppliers have networking relationships? And then who's investing, right? So uh, uh, think about those as you go through this presentation. Um, so today, uh, just statistically, about 60% of all uh, ag chem active ingredients are sourced out of China and India. And I'll show you a list later on. And India is evolving, and you know, many of the manufacturers today are trying to shift or dual source uh, out of India, but India, India has certain, uh, uh, I would say, uh, key factors which are, uh, which I'm showing here at the bottom, which 
allow, you know, kind of, kind of this change isn't going to happen very quickly. Uh, they really don't have the raw materials of the basic chemical industry. Uh, logistics in India is often, is often problematic. And also, I think over time, we will see that they're also facing environmental ch uh, challenges to be a low-cost uh, producer. Um, you don't have that many manufacturers. Um, there's lots of regulation. Now, China is a chemical hub, and uh, it's been fairly fragmented with about 2,000 uh, manufacturers. Uh, but they have uh, uh, good raw material uh, and, and logistics, uh, so therefore much more competitive. Uh, really a strong basic industry uh, for manufacturing. What has been the number one factor which challenges uh, the Chinese government right now is the, is the environment, right? And uh, this is changing politically uh, very quickly and uh, you know, compliance is either a must or uh, a shutdown. So, uh, so what does that, what does that uh, transformation look like? Uh, and you have to look at this from a three to five year perspective or longer. So in the past, you had uh, uh, many small manufacturers, over capacity of most pesticides, low quality maybe products, but a low price. Uh, we as Westerners, as uh, growers, as uh, distributors have benefited from that, uh, but with that came heavy, heavy pollution um, and frequent safety uh, accidents. And having uh, run plants in China, uh, one of my biggest nightmares when I woke up was in the morning was always making sure that you know, safety was a, a top priority. Um, so present, uh, the situation is more that the uh, central government has basically decided now to uh, clean up uh, their act and uh, uh, are shutting down. I think last year there was about 180 plants that were shut down in China uh, by the government if they were non-compliant. Um, they are also putting in regulations where you have to move to a certain distance away from uh, uh, rivers that are running through China. Uh, and of course, as they increase the environmental uh, compliance, that costs the small Chinese producers lots of money. Or if they have to move a site, uh, you can imagine that, what, what the cost of that is. So what we've seen globally is we've seen a shortage of pesticides and intermediates as this process is, is, is ongoing. Uh, I'd like to say probably here in the United States, you didn't see that effect because the channel was filled in 2017. So you didn't see that effect in 2018, but I think you're going to start feeling that more so in uh, 2019. And um, the, the future, so what does that look like? So in my opinion, for what it's worth, is the Chinese government has decided to nationalize the industry. They have said that they want to be a huge uh, uh, strategic chemical supplier uh, globally across all the uh, different chemical sectors. Well, what does that mean for agriculture? Agriculture is only a tiny piece of that, right? So uh, them putting the foot down on chemical, agrochemical manufacturers doesn't really, uh, you know, isn't really top of mind for them. Okay, so we're just, just, just being swept up in the wave. Um, so there will be a higher industry concentration. And, uh, you know, China can do that because as a totalitarian communist government, right, there is no Federal Trade Commission to oversee competition, right? So, uh, you know, this is just a dictate uh, from the top down. Uh, and and uh, then you see also that uh, the companies that have the capacity to meet the full compliance from investment are the ones that are going to survive, right? So, so um, you'll also see supply-demand shift to, to places where uh, the Chinese or the intermediate uh, companies that, that bring product across uh, uh, the ocean will see higher prices. So that'll be markets like Brazil. So we saw 
In 2018, certain shortages in the United States because uh, companies got better prices in Brazil or they got better prices in, uh, uh, in the EU. Uh, Australia uh, was very lucky. Okay, they had a drought, but boy, were they short on a lot of uh, products. And the Chinese like to joke about this. The Chinese like to say, okay, uh, if we have uh, uh, blue and clear skies, right, you will have high prices, okay? And of course, the opposite is true if you uh, reverse that. So, uh, you know, the key question here really for, for the industry right now from the input side, how does the global ag chem uh, industry compensate for the short supply in the next uh, three to five uh, years? So let me just give you some statistics here. So I mentioned before that you have about 2,000 uh, ag companies uh, manufacturing in China, about 500 um, uh, AI, active ingredient companies. Uh, you have uh, most of those companies in chemical parks. Um, sales of the top 20 companies is 16%. R&D expenses are about 1%. Uh, reuse of pesticides, waste, around 15%. And then you can see what is the goal of the central government in China. And you see that on the right-hand side. And uh, so what you see here is that uh, uh, the Chinese government is basically investing in R&D, which is good, uh, but it will acquire intensive capital and environmental uh, compliance and will ultimately drive uh, costs up uh, on the input uh, side. So uh, what does that mean for, for us here in the United States? Uh, you see the U.S. ag chem market is about $8.6 uh, I think you're going to see that just there will be a, a great amount of uh, uh, inflation uh, in, in, in that area overall. But you know, if you look at it from the U.S. potato ag chem uh, consumption, we're quite small, right? So uh, we will probably be not the major focus of, of uh, uh, you know, most uh, manufacturers. And then if you look at the, you look at the, uh, uh, the market, uh, there are two, uh, you know, fumigants, metamsodium and telone. They account for about 38% of the total U.S. potato ag chem value. Now, the good news here is uh, they are produced here in the United States or in Europe. So uh, uh, China is not a factor. But then if you go to uh, uh, the top 10 active uh, ingredients which go into the US potato market, chlorothalonil, China, 90%. Mancozep, 90% to 10%. India, China. Metribuzin, probably 50-50. Diquat, mostly China. Azoxystrobin, China, pendimethyl in China, boscular China, rimsulfuron, China, uh, metem I said it, uh, I've covered, oxymil, China. So you get the drift, okay? So it's gonna affect you uh, uh, at some point in time. So what are the impl implications from a strategic uh, sourcing uh, supply uh, standpoint? Well, uh, I can only talk about our company, but you know, I'm, I'm sure some of our competitors are, are thinking uh, the same thing. Uh, dual, dual sourcing, of course, becomes a, uh, a key success factor. In regards to our company, uh, the effect is about, we have about a 12% dependence in our portfolio on China, and that also covers uh, raw materials. Uh, and then you know, we tr we've already been on a dual sourcing strategy over the past few years, so we source from the EU, Mexico will become a bigger, a bigger manufacturer for, for agrochemicals in the future, uh, and then India. Then uh, process chemistry and formulations to, uh, is going to be key uh, to deliver alternatives, uh, to substitute maybe raw materials. Um, then precision application systems uh, will become more relevant to improve uh, grower uh, economics. And then uh, I think that you have to have a, uh, a supply chain in the East. You know, if you look at it from an equity standpoint, um, you know, I'm going to go back five years. 
you know, the world looked completely different. So on the uh, manufacturer side, uh, you know, you had, you know, a number of companies now who have merged in the West, but you've also had a shift in equity to the East. So five out of the top nine manufacturers today are owned by equity in uh, the Eastern hemisphere of the, of the globe, right? So, and they tend to think differently, they tend to invest differently, they tend to do uh, business differently. So, uh, as far as the, um, what's the, what's the, uh, uh, the, so what, who cares for your distributors and retailers who you source from? Well, they have to also think about uh, diversifying their sources. Uh, and I think probably the number one implication for you as a, as a grower community is to understand what is their strategy uh, and do you have a strategy where you can get me reliable and cost-effective uh, supply. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, as you go into maybe this year, you might want to think about not waiting to the last minute to, to get your, your, your inputs uh, uh, lined up. Uh, so for us as a company, again, uh, uh, the U.S. potato segment is our largest uh, and uh, strategic sourcing uh, for us is for this segment is, is a high priority. So we want to secure those options uh, and maintain a low cost manufacturing and sourcing operations because we are a U.S. Uh, manufacturer and uh, again, uh, with that, I'd like to just thank you for your business. Uh, we appreciate your loyalty, and we want to earn your business in, uh, in 2019. And I hope uh, this gave you a small insight into what's going on uh, outside of the United States uh, and gives you some sort of a flavor for, for what's coming uh, uh, in the days ahead. I'm going to be here today and uh, uh, the next few days, uh, I think t tomorrow also. And uh, uh, so if you have any questions, just grab me if you see me and I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, pleasure uh, and thank you for your attention.